Hey everyone, I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today, and we're here at the HIMSS 2023 conference. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in health IT. Today's guest is Mike Noche. He's founder and chief strategy and marketing officer at Veranova. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, excited for this discussion. I think this is the third time on the show. Uh, you know, we've had some great discussions about data quality, but for those that aren't familiar with you and Veranova, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Supremely grateful to be here. Being at the show right now, I feel more validated than I ever have 10 years on, because uh -huh. we've been preaching for that 10 year period, the necessity of getting, cleaning, curating, and enriching data to support various use cases in the healthcare ecosystem. And that really is a subtext theme for every session I've been to and every conversation I've had. I'm really, really grateful to be here for this conversation. Well, and I love having you on our program because you understand data and data quality better than anyone I've met. So that, that's, <laughs> this is true, right? But I think what's interesting is that as you know, we talk about data, but not all data is equal, right? So what are the keys to actually trusting the data across the multiple use cases that you mentioned? So we've spent the last 10 years building a repertoire of 350,000-ish rules to contemplate data deficiencies. I think it's That's important. That's a lot of deficiency. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and I think it's important to ground ourselves in the understanding of what the ecosystem was built on. Electronic health record systems were built to support physician and nurse workflows not secondary and tertiary uses of that data to support advanced interventions. And so I can't fault the EHRs for the way the data was captured. I can't fault the industry for not contemplating the way data could potentially be used to support artificial intelligence, because at the founding of those tools, it just wasn't even a figment of their imagination. No. And so when we think about data now, it's acknowledging that there are those deficiencies, but really trying to track towards what's important. What are the last mile goals and objectives that our clients are trying to engage with? And core to our approach is being deeply consultative and asking business leaders, what are your people? What are your processes? What are your tools? What are your whiteboard of priorities? And what data do you have at your disposal? So we can, with their support, build a data architecture that actually meets not just a point solution, say diabetes for case management, but that same set of information can be used across the entire continuum of the organization. Risk adjustment, quality measurement, AI, advanced analytics. Mm -hmm. So when we think about why data is so difficult to quantify in terms of value. It's everybody has a slightly different take mm -hmm. on what it should be used for, how it should be employed, how timely it needs to be. And it's beholden to us to help them walk through that journey. Yeah. I think one of those other questions that a lot of healthcare organizations are asking is around provenance of the data, right? But do users really care about where the data comes from? What are you seeing? It depends upon the user. Okay. I've used this metaphor with you before. Uh, just like oil coming out of the ground, crude is worthless. If you want to fuel a Toyota, you have to get to 87 grade. A Ferrari, uh -huh. it's 99. Healthcare is the same. And so the quality continuum for a case management solution may be 87 and an AI baby 99. Provenance is exactly the same. Depending upon the stakeholder mm -hmm. and the objectives they have for execution, they may care more or less in the provenance of the data. Our philosophy is, provenance reigns supreme. Even if a customer doesn't think they need it, <laughs> they may need it to, later. Yeah, we prefer to <laughs> opt more like uh, the Steve Jobs of the world to say, I hear you, we're gonna meet you where you are. We're also gonna take care of you in the case that the thing you didn't contemplate pops up later on. Uh, yeah, that, that's so fascinating. I remember someone saying that, well, let's just collect everything just in case we need it later, which has its own challenges. And to be honest, uh, you know, this goes to the provenance question as well, that hey, it's great to have data and, and all of the context, but once you have all the context, now you're almost overwhelmed with an avalanche of too much data and provenance and history and all, all of this. Like, how do you kind of balance these kind of you know, competing ideas that, hey, we want everything, but don't give us so much that we're overwhelmed? Like, how, how do you balance that? <laughs> so I mentioned that we spent the last 10 years building hundreds of thousands of rules. Mm -hmm. We often say that our core business is like submarine racing. <laughs> Below board, very complicated to see, nobody really knows it's happening. Uh -huh. So we've been hard at work taking those core competencies and bringing those thought pieces above board. Oh. Over the last nine months, we've injected a tremendous amount of time and energy, trying to build a visual layer that helps everybody from an executive to an internal operator, all the way down to a quality assurance team that does an audit on the data, that they can see what happened across that provenance chain and have faith either in the financial return of mm -hmm. these business objectives 
or can see trends in your structure management, your identity resolution, your code norming, your encounter logic, the really nitty gritty nerdy stuff in the middle. <laughs> and then when you've got an auditor at the last mile, what they really want to see is, okay, Mike Veranova, you helped us aggregate all of this clinical data from all these sources. Show me Sally Smith's encounter. How many did she have over the last five years? What was the depth of data that was produced in those encounters? And being able to see where the data started from a message and from a source, what actions we took on it, why we took those actions, mm -hmm. and what was resultant. And that could be as simple as, I get a bunch of carrots for systolic blood pressure and I need to make it just systolic, uh -huh. or mapping to uh, the right types of units. Or more complicated, when you're thinking about inference logic that goes way down the rabbit hole, trying to take disparate parts of messages in Sally's encounter to create something more comprehensive for an advanced use case. You know, what's stunning to me is thinking about the old data warehouse days, where it was just slam all the data in there. Like, well, the way you're talking is such an, an uh, not even an evolution, it's like so well beyond an evolution of, of how people are thinking about data. Is, is that what customers really want? Is this advanced, you know, not just, because I think back in the enterprise data warehouse days, it was just like, we need one of these. <laughs> and now you're talking about business objectives, which feels like a very different conversation. I, I, again, I'm not going to fault anybody for where they were on sure. their journey. Data without context, as you said, is very difficult to interpret. Mm -hmm. And in old days, namely working with payers or vendors, they just assumed that their traditional business processes of working with claims would map into the clinical data ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So they said, yeah, give it to me when I'm ready, I'll handle it then. Uh -huh. The reality has been far from that truth. If you would have asked me nine months ago whether or not the industry was prepared for this, I would have thought it'd be two to five years down the line. But over the last six to nine months, there've been more and more people coming to the table to say, hey, I tried to do this myself, <laughs> and I failed, either with a data warehouse or sure. some internal data quality assessment, or hey, I talked to a friend at a very large organization and they failed. So the conversation now is less about why this needs to happen, like the importance of data quality, and more about what needs to happen. How do we be thoughtful about the continuum of data provenance, the actions that need to be taken on it, in alignment to the way you're gonna support your bottom line. Yeah, so how is this Veranova working to really accelerate the experience for data users? That is a journey. As I <laughs> that's said, an important thing to remember. Yeah, that's a really, and, really good point. <laughs> and I think anybody that says they're going to be a silver bullet, they're going to take all your data and make it purpose built or fit for purpose for everything, hasn't experienced the pain of the data. Mm -hmm. We like to think about our core operation in three different tiers. 40% okay. of data that we get is generally good enough for the use cases our clients define. The next 40%, the logic we've built over the last decade, solves those data issues. The remaining 20%, we've had to be really thoughtful about a learning environment, saying things like, there's a new standard, or there's an EHR upgrade, and we've never seen this before. How do we be thoughtful about prioritizing what our algorithms think might be a right match, but isn't quite there, elevating to the top and have an appropriate clinical and data science team to support it? People say, but Mike, 80%, like that's not good enough. <laughs> well, it's a dramatic improvement from 40. Sure. We are fallible, the data is fallible, our job is to do what you just said, elevate the data as much as possible and then paint a picture for the gaps that still exist so that we can either build new logic or we can help our customers go back to their sources and say, hey, the data just wasn't there. Uh -huh. You didn't give me a date timestamp. You didn't give me a <laughs> provider. It's very difficult to fill in those gaps. And it's narrowing the window of what's necessary to engage the last mile and having them make changes. Because our, our job in the industry, $250 billion annually, is lost in friction between payers and providers. That's a class stat. And that's because data is going ping-ponging back and forth. I sent a claim, I need more information, I gave you more information, what's happening? We don't want to create more friction. We're trying to reduce it by being very finite in the sorts of information we're requesting and then mitigating the amount of requests for change. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting to hear you describe that. It sounds like that's why you created your DCAS solution. So can you talk to me about that and how it kind of visualizes the raw data versus the curated and enriched data for users? Yeah, of course. The continuum of data quality is a difficult one to describe to a novice that hasn't engaged in this space. Uh, there's lots of solutions in this arena that are really good at point data quality issues. Uh -huh. Integration engines for structure management, EMPI for identity resolution, code norming tools that allow you to take ICD-9 and map it to ICD-10. There's encounter and data <laughs> provenance. 
there's really 10 steps in the way we think about it. Wow. And so our hope in taking these visualizations above all of that nitty gritty work is to be able to paint a digestible narrative. We far too often see that prospects and customers say, I got it, I'm ready to engage in data quality. I just bought an EMPI, that's gonna be good enough. <laughs> and I'm not, I totally agree that identity resolution is a core staple, mm -hmm. but it's not the entirety of the continuum. Gotcha. And through these visual layers of being able to say, what are your business objectives? At RAW, the data that came through our front door was 42% aligned to your case management for diabetes and your risk adjustment calculations and your quality measurement score attempting to improve by half a star. 45% of the data was fit for purpose. After our deep dive on the data and our wow. algorithmic work, we lifted that to 80% for the data overall and 95% for the specific finite business objectives that are in front of you. And it is a continuum. You've got to be ready to engage in that continuum. Yeah, and no one has that data now. <laughs> you know, like, they're just guessing. That's what it feels like to me. So that's really an interesting approach. Let's dive in more to the business objectives sure. that you kind of talked about. And how should these healthcare organizations be approaching linking the business objectives to the data quality that you just talked about? And then obviously, how can they use that to get buy-in from leadership? Which, you know, because everyone's like, wait, isn't the data quality? If I'm, a, if I'm a CEO, I'm like, wait, so you're telling me we enter data poorly? Or <laughs> that would be concerning. So, you know, help us understand that. Yeah. It's been a necessary evil for us to be deeply engaged in a consultative manner with our prospects. It doesn't necessarily have to be us, mm -hmm. because before we start any data receipt and any data assessment, we're asking those key business leaders what's important to them, mm -hmm. agnostic of data. And they can always tell us, you know, if I were able to have more timely clinical information for my diabetic patient population, I'd save $100 a member a month. Wow. Or if you're able to early identify colorectal cancer patients when they're stage one instead of stage four, that's a $200,000 savings. Wow. Depending upon who you talk to in the business divisions, they'll have a different answer. Mm -hmm. And core to our mission is not telling them what the financial return is. It's irrelevant what I think it is. It only matters what's important to them. And by starting with their financial calculations, their assertions, their assessments, it allows us to modify our approach to assessing the quality of the information. So when we actually come back to them after a trial or a proofing statement, say, hey, we heard from your quality management team that these six disease states were important. They had these financial milestones that were important to them before our work. This is the patient population that you were able to assess. After our work, it jumped by 30%. That's 11 or 50 or 150,000 patients. Uh -huh. Multiply that by the 50 or $100 PM PM. That's your math, not ours. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, a small payer, a few hundred thousand patients, could be tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, scales quickly. Large payers <laughs> are hundreds of millions with their math, not ours. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting about that is it goes back to your qu the question of providence and how important that is, or, or even data quality and how important that is. If you understand the key objective and the business objective, you can then align and say, oh, you know what, the data's quality is fine, or no, the data quality needs to improve. Yeah, yeah totally agree. As I said before in the, the oil metaphor, for a case management workflow, 87% might be sufficient. If you're trying to do AI, you're gonna need far more granular quality of information. And depending upon where you are in your business journey, we can help you at the 87% now, but not close the door on 99 later. And that's really a platform customer centric approach. We're keeping that door open so that way as your business objectives change over time, we can continue to support you. Well, Mike, I always appreciate talking to you, being educated by you and all the learnings you have at Veranovum and, and the way you're, you know, you're helping to improve healthcare. So I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcast application. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.